Welcome back to the Hair Cafe Cinematic Universe, Hair Loss Witchers. Remember, a finasteride a day keeps the hair transplant doctor away. So, one of the most frequent questions I get on this channel is what to do if you get side effects from finasteride. Contrary to what some people like to claim, I do acknowledge that there are people who get side effects on finasteride, although the incidence of side effects is way overblown online, and in fact, they are very rare. But one of the goals of this channel is to help educate people on what to do if they do get side effects on finasteride, and I've made several videos on the subject. When I say side effects are rare, I really mean it. Keep in mind, Chooms, that in the initial studies of finasteride for androgenic alopecia, which included more than 1,500 men, the absolute difference in the incidence of side effects versus the placebo control group was only 2% in the first year. So, the vast majority of people who take finasteride will never experience any side effects whatsoever. Not only that, if you look at when side effects occur, they almost always occur within the first year of taking finasteride. In the PLESS study, in older men taking finasteride at 5 mg per day for treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia, there was no difference in the incidence of side effects between the treatment group and the placebo control group after the first year of the study. Also, even if you are one of the 2% of people who do get side effects from finasteride, the side effects will almost always resolve on their own with continued use of the drug. So, even if you do get side effects, you should try to muscle through them for a few months before considering any adjustment to your titration or your treatment protocol. That's the first strategy for people who get side effects on finasteride. But let's say you've been on finasteride for a year and you're certain that the drug is still giving you side effects. What should you do then? Well, one strategy that's not talked about very often is to just try and accept it. Like, say for example you take finasteride and you get slightly lower libido. Is that ideal? Of course not. But you may decide that's an okay trade-off in exchange for keeping your hair. That is a perfectly reasonable decision to make. But Let's say the side effects aren't bearable for you. What do you do then? Well, in that case, I'd suggest trying to titrate down the dose of the drug. You could try 0.5 milligrams or 0.2 milligrams daily or even every other day. It's even possible to go down as low as just 0.1 milligrams per day of finasteride and still get a hair loss prevention benefit from the drug. That's because the effects of finasteride on scalp and serum DHT suppression are not very dose dependent. Once you get above 0.05 milligrams per day, you are getting nearly as much scalp and serum DHT suppression as you would get even if you took 5 milligrams of finasteride per day. That's one reason why 1 milligrams of finasteride per day was chosen as the recommended dose of the drug for treating hair loss as opposed to the 5 milligram dose used for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia. It is the most effective dose of the drug for hair loss and going above that dose doesn't yield any additional benefit. So if you're starting finasteride, you should probably start with the 1 milligram per day dose since the side effect profile is already very low and there's no point in starting from a position of compromise. But if you're one of the rare individuals who can't use it at one milligram per day, you're definitely not out of options, Shums. It is very reasonable to titrate the dose down under those circumstances. That way, you'll get nearly the same amount of DHT suppression and a lower dose can potentially eliminate side effects. Now, I'm sure someone is thinking right now, but Kevin, if DHT levels don't change that much when you lower the dose of finasteride, why would the side effects get better? Can you answer that one, bro? Well, that's because, contrary to popular belief, the side effects of 5 error blocking drugs like finasteride don't come from lowering DHT levels. Contrary to what you hear from DHT simps in the online manosphere of black-pilled internet tough guys and culture warriors, DHT in adults is a trash hormone, and lowering it does not cause side effects. The reason why side effects happen from 5 error blocking drugs is because of changes in the ratio of testosterone levels to estrogen levels. Specifically, if the ratio of testosterone to estrogen falls, men can get decreased libido and sexual problems. However, if the ratio increases, you can actually get increased libido from a 5 year blocker like finasteride, and many people actually report this after starting finasteride. The reason the ratio of testosterone to estrogen can change on a 5 year inhibitor is because when the conversion of testosterone to DHT is blocked, testosterone levels will increase. This actually does happen. With finasteride, the testosterone levels increase by about 10 to 15 percent initially. That would normally be a great benefit from finasteride except the excess testosterone has to be metabolized and a lot of it is metabolized by the aromatase enzyme that converts testosterone into estradiol, which is an estrogen. Depending on how much testosterone is aromatized, the overall testosterone to estrogen ratio could go up, it could go down, or it could stay the same. And it only takes slight changes in testosterone and estrogen levels to affect that ratio. So that is the reason some people get decreased libido and some people get increased libido on finasteride. And I go over this strange phenomenon in greater detail in my earlier
earlier video on what to do if you do get side effects from finasteride, which I'll link below. So that's my advice for people who get side effects from finasteride. You should first always try to push through for a few months and wait for the side effects to get better or go away completely on their own. If side effects are not tolerable though, then you should try to titrate the dose of finasteride down to a level where the side effects go away. Remember, you can use doses as low as just 0.1 milligrams per day and the drug is still effective for stopping hair loss. Also, one other strategy that I don't suggest very often because I don't think it is usually necessary is to try topical finasteride, and that's because the systemic absorption is less. However, there is still some systemic absorption, so this might not solve the problem if you can't even tolerate low doses of oral finasteride. But let's assume you can't tolerate finasteride at all under any circumstances. You've tried 0.1 milligrams of oral finasteride, you've tried topical finasteride, nothing works. You always get sides and the side effects do not go away on their own. Are there any options left for you? Well. In the past, if you were to come up to me and say you can't use a 5-air inhibitor at all under any circumstances, what I'd probably do is suggest trying a topical antiandrogen like pyrolutamide, clascoterone, or fluoridol, but these aren't the easiest substances to use, or in some cases to even obtain, and their efficacy doesn't seem as good as finasteride. But I've recently come to the conclusion that maybe, just maybe, people who don't tolerate finasteride should try joining the dutasteride master race instead. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Kevin, that's crazy, bro. If if you were having side effects from a moderately strong 5-air blocking drug like finasteride, wouldn't you get even worse side effects on a stronger 5-air blocker like dutasteride? Well, I don't actually think it's crazy. Yes, I am indeed suggesting that finasteride peasants who don't tolerate finasteride should definitely consider joining the dutasteride master race. I am recommending this based on some data I have presented in previous videos as well as some new studies that I'll present here for the very first time. As I've noted in previous videos, even though dutasteride is a stronger 5-air blocker than finasteride and it is more effective at regrowing hair than finasteride, it doesn't have more side effects than finasteride, which is fantastic. For example, in this meta-analysis of finasteride and dutasteride studies, dutasteride was more effective at increasing hair counts compared to finasteride, and the incidence of side effects was comparable with both drugs. Even more surprising, there are some studies like this one from Good Korea that show that the incidence of side effects with dutasteride may be even lower than the incidence of side effects with finasteride. Now, I was already aware of this research before, but I recently came across even more data that shows that dutasteride is better tolerated than finasteride. I I found two studies based on databases that are used to report adverse drug reports. The first study is this one here, and it uses the FAERS, that's the FAERS database. Now, FAERS stands for the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System, and it is notoriously unreliable as a database system. You may have also heard of a similar database called the VAERS database that is used to report vaccine side effects, but unfortunately, it was rendered absolutely and completely useless by anti-vaccine crunchy bombs and conspiracy theorists ever since COVID hit, and that's when people flooded the database with all sorts of bullshit claims like the vaccine made them magnetic or it made them infertile. So basically, the same type of people who spread fear and misinformation about finasteride. You see, the big problem with both the FAERS and the VAERS database is that anyone can file a report online to these databases, and there's no validation of these reports whatsoever. However, despite this massive limitation, this first study does contain some very interesting information, though it can't answer definitively whether finasteride causes more side effects than dutasteride. The study analyzed the reports of adverse events related to finasteride and dutasteride use over a period of 19 years, from 2000 to 2019. The investigators narrowed down the reports to just men who took finasteride at 1 mg or 5 mg per day, or dutasteride at 0.5 mg per day. So, if we look at the data in the FAERS database, the number of symptoms reported for each case report was higher with finasteride than it was with dutasteride. This was true even when looking at the reports from healthcare providers, which is the column labeled HCP in this table here. Like I said, anyone can file reports to the FAERS database, and as you can see here, only 14% of the reports filed for finasteride at 1 mg per day actually came from professional healthcare providers. The rest came from finasteride users themselves. You can also see from this table that users of finasteride at 5 mg per day and users of dutasteride at 0.5 mg per day were much older than the finasteride 1 mg per day users. That's because most of the men on high-dose finasteride or on dutasteride were taking it for benign prostatic hyperplasia 
which is a disease that almost exclusively affects older men. If you look at the percentage of different types of adverse events, sexual side effects made up a much higher incidence of the adverse events with finasteride at 1 milligram per day compared with finasteride at 5 milligrams per day or dutasteride at 0.5 milligrams per day. Also, as is somewhat common nowadays, people report mental side effects like brain fog or depression from finasteride, even though those side effects were never seen in the initial clinical trials of the drug. These supposed mental side effects are much more common with finasteride at 1 milligram per day than at 5 milligrams per day or with dutasteride. But neurological side effects from finasteride are not actually real, and I'll go ahead and link the My Neurosteroids playlist below if you want to learn more about that. But here's where it gets interesting, Jims. You see, if you look at the total number of reports of adverse effects with both drugs over time, you see that up until around the year 2010, adverse event reports were more frequent with dutasteride than they were with finasteride. After 2011, though, dutasteride reports became gradually less frequent, while finasteride reports absolutely skyrocketed. Now, what happened at around 2010 and 2011 to make that happen, you may wonder? Well, in 2010, Merck added depression to the package labeling for finasteride. In 2011, erectile dysfunction occurring after stopping the drug was added, aka post-finasteride syndrome. But to be clear here, Chums, the FDA itself has said that there was no reasonable evidence to show a causal link between finasteride and either depression or persistent sexual problems. Merck only added them to the label to prevent lawsuits. Post-finasteride syndrome doesn't actually exist. However, if you look at what happened with adverse event reporting around 2010 and 2011, you see that the number of adverse events reported shot way, way up, including mental and neurological events that, like I said, were never even reported in the earlier studies, including the initial clinical trials that included thousands of subjects. You can see that the source of these reports was almost entirely from finasteride users, not from actual healthcare professionals. Before 2010, the majority of the reports came from healthcare professionals, but after 2010, the vast majority of reports came from users directly. So, paradoxically, the lowest dose of the weaker 5-air blocker, specifically 1 milligrams per day of finasteride, was associated with the highest incidence of side effects. However, the fact that the incidence of side effects skyrocketed in the 2010s after Merck altered the package labeling, it strongly suggests that this increase was entirely due to all the rampant fear-mongering from DHT-simping dipshit influencers, and it is causing widespread nocebo-induced delusions in the hair loss community that continue to this very day. During during the early 2010s, groups like the Propecia Help Forum and the PFS Network were formed and they became very popular misinformation silos dedicated to gaslighting finasteride and they still remain active to this very day, although their influence has definitely waned dramatically. They're not a fraction as powerful as they once were and the majority of medical professionals largely disregard them as a cult and I actually made a video about that which I'll link below. So getting back to the research, this study concluded that finasteride has a higher risk of side effects than dutasteride, but it is difficult to tell how much of this increased incidence of side effects is just from fear-mongering inflamed by social media. So, let's take a look at the second study on the subject. This study was announced in an article in the journal Urology Times. The title is, quote, Real-world 5-error inhibitor data show increased sexual side effects with finasteride versus dutasteride, unquote. The article is based on a study presented at the European Association of Urology Annual Congress. It's this study here. Unlike the previous study that used the FAERS database, this study used a European database called the UDRO Vigilance Database. The UDRA Vigilance Database differs from the FAERS database in several very important ways. First of all, in the EU, reporting adverse reactions by healthcare workers is mandatory, unlike in the United States. Secondly, the vast majority of reports come from healthcare providers, not patients. Finally, all reports undergo a strict validation procedure to ensure that they are legitimate, so it's much better than what we have in the United States. So obviously, the UDRA Vigilance Database is much more reliable than the FAERS database. And in the study, it was found that finasteride was associated with a higher risk of ejaculation disorders, erectile dysfunction, and decreased libido compared to dutasteride. Unlike the study that used the FAERS database, though, most of the reported sexual adverse events came from older subjects in the 65 to 85 year old range. The study concluded that, quote, real life data suggests finasteride is associated with a higher sexual adverse events when compared to dutasteride, unquote. So we now have several studies indicating that finasteride has a higher incidence of side effects than dutasteride does, though a lot of this data is based on databases and not on randomized controlled trials. This may seem strange to a lot of people since dutasteride suppresses DHT more than finasteride, but maybe the clue lies in this figure here which I showed before. I mentioned that finasteride increases serum testosterone by about 10 to 15 
15%. And the side effects that occur from finasteride are due to the conversion of some of that testosterone into estrogen by the aromatase enzyme. However, if you look at the changes in testosterone with dutasteride, you see in this figure that with 0.5 milligrams of dutasteride, serum testosterone increases by up to 25%. So maybe this big increase in testosterone ensures that the ratio of testosterone to estrogen favors testosterone, which would make sexual side effects less common with dutasteride than with finasteride. But one thing is definitely for certain, decreasing more DHT does not lead to more side effects. If it were that simple, then dutasteride would definitely have more side effects than finasteride, but it doesn't. If anything, the evidence points towards dutasteride having fewer side effects than finasteride. So based on all this information, I think that if you are convinced that being a finasteride peasant isn't for you, or if you're getting side effects on finasteride, then you should strongly consider joining the dutasteride master race. I know I have had several of my viewers tell me that they switched from finasteride to dutasteride after getting side effects from finasteride and that they didn't get side effects on dutasteride. Now, it's of course completely possible that some of those people just had side effects that would have gone away on their own as they usually do with continued use of finasteride, but it's also completely plausible that dutasteride is simply just a better tolerated drug than finasteride and the evidence does seem to confirm that so far. So whatever your takeaway may be from this video, I am not trying to make it out to be like finasteride is redundant. It still definitely has some objective advantages over dutasteride, such as being cheaper, easier to titrate since it is a tablet you can quarter instead of a soft gel like dutasteride. Also, unlike dutasteride, it doesn't contain gelatin, which makes it appropriate for vegans, which is one of the reasons why I'm a finasteride peasant myself. But it does seem that the more research that gets released about dutasteride, the more clear it becomes that it is objectively the superior drug, not just in terms of efficacy, we already knew that of course, but also in terms of its side effect profile. But let's be clear here, Chums. Even if dutasteride is the better drug, the fact remains that both finasteride and dutasteride are outstanding hair loss treatments that will stop and reverse hair loss in the vast majority of people who use them. So whether you wish to join the dutasteride master race or the finasteride peasantry, you can definitely rest assured that the slaphead curse will be well under control, and that way you'll never have to worry about becoming yet another bald and bearded clode who will forever be known amongst his peers and family members as that bald guy. Thank you for watching Hair Loss Witchers. I'll see you all next time. God bless.